I'm Alex Berman, and you're watching Selling Breakdowns. Sometimes when you walk through a mall or down the aisle at a supermarket, the amount of choice available to you seems almost overwhelming. If you want a plain white t-shirt, there are hundreds of brands you could pick from, all at different price points. Even buying something as simple as water, you stare at a forest of different shaped bottles and logos for what's effectively the same product, no matter how much they try to push their differences. But in business terms, the choice is an illusion. Often a whole market is controlled by just a handful of companies, so no matter what you pick, the money comes back to them. Today we're going to look at one company who has almost completely cornered its market without consumers realizing it. It's the glasses and sunglass manufacturer Luxottica. We'll see how they took control of the sunglass world and then explore some other businesses that work in a similar way. Leonardo del Vecchio started Luxottica in 1961 after learning his trade as a metal worker making tools and dice. In the early days, they built up their own branded eyewear and brought up Scrone, a distribution company, so that he could better control distribution. In 1988, he struck a deal that would start the process of Luxottica taking over the glasses business. They signed a licensing deal with Armani to make a wide range of products for them which would bear the Armani logo. And so it continued until they had a huge monopoly. They currently control about 80% of the eyewear industry, and it's thought that over half a billion people stare out of their frames every day. They own Ray-Ban, Oakley, Persol, and many others, as well as working under the license for D&G, Chanel, Ralph Lauren, in fact, most of the biggest fashion brands. More than this, they also own retail outlets like Sunglass Hut, Sears Optical, and Target Optical. It's insane how much of the industry they control. And this monopoly has been hugely beneficial to Luxottica, but also to the licensed brands, which is why they're happy to keep this status quo. The margins on eyewear can be over a thousand percent because Luxottica can do whatever they want. They can crush any competition. They took control of Oakley simply by limiting how many pairs they sold in Sunglass Hut stores. This crashed the Oakley stock and they were forced to merge. For Ray-Bans, they were selling at just $30 in major chain stores at the end of the 90s. Luxottica took them off the market for a year or so and then relaunched at almost five times the price. They have a revenue of around 7 billion euros and operating profit of about a billion. So who else enjoys this kind of monopoly? YKK are another hidden part of the fashion industry and take almost 90% of the zipper market. It's surprising, right? They're a Japanese company and despite being used on a huge proportion of the world's clothing, revenues are only about $7 billion. Don't get me wrong, it's serious revenue, but you'd think you'd make more for basically keeping the planet's pants on. YKK are so serious about their zippers that they also own the machine manufacturers and the brass used to make them. In the food and drink industry, you might not get these massive 80-90% control numbers, but there are some seriously big fish. Unilever owns a big portion of all the ice cream. They own Ben & Jerry, Magnum, Cornetto, and many countries' major brands, all under their heart brand. You'll also recognize the logo for sure. AB InBev provide over 20% of the beer with brands like Budweiser, Corona, Hogard, and Stella Artois and many others, they had an operating profit of 16.75 billion in 2016. Monopolies may make shareholders a healthy income, but they are generally considered a bad thing for the economy. There's no urgency to innovate if you know you can keep selling what you have. It's also easier to suppress wages since there aren't a lot of rivals for staff to move to, nor are they likely to attempt to strike out on their own using what they learned. So what do you do if your business is up against a major player that takes a huge slice of the pie? The only thing you can do is embrace flexibility. Find a niche and specialize so that you're offering something more attractive to a specific set of customers. Their scale means that they're likely able to beat you on price, so undercutting rarely works, partly because it also makes you look lower quality. But smaller businesses can change and adapt more quickly, so look for those opportunities to meet customer needs, one that the big players just don't cater to yet. Want to learn more about business theory and history? Be sure to like and subscribe to be notified of our next segment.